Um, I do want to say a very quick word about terminology before we begin, because um, uh, I realize that there's a lot of historiographical debate over the appropriate way to characterize the Iranian poets and indeed uh, any writers or any people throughout history that we might incline to call gay, lesbian, queer, bisexual, you know, these, these various terms, because there is the issue that these are pretty modern terms uh, being used to describe a very wide range of things. So as we'll talk about in just a minute in the ancient world, there's very different, uh, there's very different perspectives on sort of, you know, is it a behavior or is it an identity? Um, but I think today it's appropriate, in my opinion, to refer to these authors as gay and as homosexual and indeed as queer, uh, because actually they come from the very beginning of the kind of deliberate categorization and study of what we would call LGBT issues today um, in uh, such terms. This is, uh, this is the very beginning of the time when people like this gentleman, Karl Heinrich Ulrich here, who was an Austrian activist, the very beginning of the time when they're starting to say, there's this group of people characterized not just by a behavior, but by an identity that distinguishes them. And that's why we'll, we're going to have special words for them rather than just saying, this is something they do every so often. So Ulrich um, invented this term Uranian. Um, this uh, this uh, terrifying German title page on the left is from his uh, his uh, major publication, Uranus, Beiträge uh, zur uh, Erforschung des Naturrätsels des Uranismus, the uh, contributions to the research of the riddle of nature. Uranism. Now, eventually, the term homosexual, which was actually invented by a friend of his, won out. But um, but uh, Uranian was the term sort of accepted at the time for studying this uh, this sort of newfound uh, identity that was coming to be realized by people, um, mainly in, in in Western Europe in the eighteen seventies and eighties. Uh, I also want to say just a, a quick a quick word of, of, of warning that um, some of the material and uh, 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 behaviors or ideas described uh, later, both in the ancient world and among these Uranian poets, uh, would today be understood at, in terms like like pederasty. So I don't by any means mean to conflate the modern term or identity of gay or homosexual with with that because. Because, I mean, as a gay man myself, I'm very sensitive to the damage that that conflation and that canard has, um, has caused throughout history. But anyway, moving on to the very beginnings of the ideas that would later influence the Uranian poets, their precursors in history and culture and literature. So, of course, uh, English, British literature uh, have a very long tradition of what we, again, today would describe as gay or queer ideas and people. Uh, for example, Shakespeare's sonnets, many of them are notoriously, uh, you know, pretty gay in their, in their uh, addressee and their, and their setup. Um, Lord Byron was uh, uh, flamboyantly bisexual, again, in modern terms. Uh, and we also see early on a kind of critical response uh, to to that same the same idea then conceived of more as a behavior as a thing people did uh, John Dryden in the late 1600s uh, called what we would call uh, homosexuality uh, quote a damned love trick new brought over from France uh, so of course being from France means it's the worst possible thing in the world um, but uh, we don't see the beginnings of kind of this identity until the 19th century. Um, I hope, uh, as it, uh, you know, you can, you can probably tell from the barbaric way that I speak that uh, I'm an American, and uh, I hope it won't come off as arrogant if I um, try to place the beginnings of this movement in the work of an American across the Atlantic. Um, so in the 1850s and 60s, uh, you see this astounding radical individualism starting to be expressed uh, in poetry in America, uh, most especially in the poetry of, of, of Walt Whitman, who's often seen back home as sort of 
the national poet uh, of, of America. Um, his most famous line is, I celebrate myself and sing myself. And um, within that individualism is this kind of earthy uh, and exploratory sexuality. Uh, Whitman himself actually denied later in life uh, a kind, any direct connections to the Uranian movement or, or what would follow. Uh, but if you listen, listen to a little bit of his poetry and you might see in comparison with Comes Next, why I'm rooting this movement kind of in his modes of expression. So uh, from one poem in Leaves of Grass, I dreamed in a dream, I saw a city invincible to the attacks of the whole rest of the earth. I dreamed that was the new city of friends. Nothing was greater than, there than the quality of robust love. It led the rest. It was seen every hour in the actions of the men of that city and in all their looks and words. So in this, we see a notion of friendship or comradeship that in just a few years will develop very specifically into a sort of homosocial and even homoerotic uh, kind of notion. Um, Whitman often phrases uh, his idea of friendships in deeply emotional and romantic and even sexual terms. Uh, one last uh, of his poems, we two boys together clinging, one the other never leaving, up and down the roads going, north and south excursions making, power enjoying, elbows stretching, fingers clutching, armed and fearless, eating, drinking, sleeping, loving. Now, the big difference between Whitman and his followers, again, is that Whitman denied specifically an involvement with any kind of Uranian or homosexual movement, even though, as this caption to the picture uh, represents, uh, he's thought by many to have had a, a partner for a number of years who was a man, an Irish bus driver. Um, but anyway, his uh, followers and, and, collab and uh, correspondents, uh, J.A. Simons, and Edward Carpenter took his poetry across the Atlantic to this country and combined that radical individualism with uh, a new idea of social and sexual reform. Uh, it started in the 1870s and 80s with uh, a number of works, uh, not only of poetry, but sort of of, of ethics and philosophy. Um, uh, so, for example, on the left here, this book, Sexual Inversion, um, was written by this fellow named Simons, uh, sort of as an, an ethical study of who are this category of people we seem to be identifying who have this, who have this kind of inborn, inborn characteristic that sets them apart, and what is the appropriate social and legal and political response. And alongside all of this, it's phrased in terms, again, of friendship and comradeship, sort of the pure spiritual, uh, even partly romantic friendship outlined by Plato famously uh, in ancient Greece 2,400 years previously. So uh, one poem of Simon's reads, comradeship spreads tents on the open road, filled ocean camp, where e'er in brotherhood men lay their heads, soldier with soldier, tramp with casual tramp, Cross and recross, meet, part, share boards and beds, where wayside love still lights his beaconing lamp. So Simons worked partly as an ethicist and philosopher, partly as a poet, and he mentored uh, many of the figures like Edward Carpenter and Lord Alfred Douglas, who would become very prominent in this Uranian movement, but we're still not there yet. Um, sort of the very first blast of the trumpet really comes with uh, this man in the picture to the left, Edward Carpenter. Um, he's been called by some the gay godfather of the British left. Um, I actually think this is a great exaggeration because uh, as a social reformer, sort of broadly and politically, Carpenter was not successful. Uh, his political ideas and social ideas really didn't gain much currency and didn't result in improvement of life for the working class, for example. But his ideas on sex and relationships and comradeships uh, would come to define the Iranian movement and indeed kind of the beginning of, of an idea of, um, of queer identity and consciousness in, uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. 
Uh, what's fascinating about his book, Towards Democracy, and of the writings of people in his circle, that would be sort of the first Uranians, is this kind of, this model of personal and sexual relationships that they call, again, friendship or comradeship, that is at one and the same time egalitarian, but also very paternalistic. It's egalitarian in the sense that uh, they believed sort of uniquely uh, almost among, among people uh, involved in writing and politics at the time that people like them with an elite kind of middle-class uh, ed education and wealth situation and career should welcome working class people into their schools, into their social circles, and indeed into their homes. Um, and so this idea of sort of class boundary crossing relationships was really radical at the time. On the other hand, there's something kind of paternalistic about it and uh, even sort of rooted in the imperial and colonial discourse at the time in this late Victorian age, uh, because it's always a sort of established and stable uh, uh, younger or middle-aged uh, middle-class man uh, with a, with a uh, sort of early adult or teenage uh, working class guy. Uh, and the idea being, oh, we will civilize you. We will show you the right way to live by, by incorporating you into our circles and our ways of speaking and thinking. So this kind of, on the one hand, democratic, on the other hand, aristocratic model of cross-class companionship uh, would end up being a big influence on the Iranian poets to come. Uh, in the 1890s, there was actually rumblings based on this of sort of a wider reaching public campaign for acceptance and toleration for um, Iranians or sexual inverts or homosexuals, whatever the, the, the term would be. Um, and Carpenter, this, this fellow, came out with a pamphlet called Homogenic Love uh, that circulated privately, but was aimed at kind of building respectable middle-class support for his political goals. Uh, one of his friends wrote to him in response to this pamphlet uh, saying, we want a cruel, unimpassioned statement of the situation, and doctors and lawyers must be induced to take off their spectacles and look. This came out in 1895 with great excitement among this kind of early core of the Iranian movement, but the timing was terrible. Weeks after this, Oscar Wilde was arrested on charges of sodomy. Uh, that's, you know, that whole trial and process isn't worth getting into right now, but uh, suffice it to say that Wilde's sort of spectacular prosecution for indecency and, uh, and uh, you know, writing sodomitical uh, uh, things uh, immediately turned public opinion very strongly against decadence uh, like, uh, like him. So uh, the, you know, the newspapers and magazines were vehemently opposed to his attack on good, you know, good social mores, of course, with complete hypocrisy, because many, you know, many members of the elite at the time were taking mistresses and having affairs and all of this. But Wilde's um, addition of the gay element to that caused this huge public backlash uh, that forced many of the uh, many people with these sympathies sort of into hiding, so to speak. Uh, Carpenter himself, as I said, never found success as a widespread social reformer. He retreated to a cottage in the wilderness with his partner, George Merrill, also pictured here, who was one of these examples of a working class person. I believe he was a, a coal heaver that uh, Carpenter took under his wing uh, and uh, lived with for the rest of his life. Now, in addition to this social and sexual reformist kind of movement, we also have an aesthetic movement developing throughout this century too. Um, going back to the 1780s even, we have people like this fellow on the left, uh, uh, Johann Winkelmann, uh, who sort of institutes for the first time the detailed scientific study of art history and the classical past. 
um, there had always been a level of admiration for the classics since the Renaissance uh, in this country and, and in the rest of Europe. But Winkelmann was sort of the first to put it on a really scientific footing with publications and detailed studies. Uh, he was also extremely gay. He had this almost open sort of well, homosexual lifestyle sounds like a very old fashioned way to put it, but but he he was known to have male lovers and to uh, suffuse his writings with an admiration uh, to on a sexual level of the male form. Uh, his method of rigorous art historical study combined with uh, kind of a a particularly uh, gay kind of personal and, and aesthetic approach was uh, continued by the fellow in the middle, Walter Pater, who worked in the mid and late 1800s as a scholar of Renaissance uh, uh, art, art history. He again uh, wanted to bring the appreciation of the classics and then the, the neoclassical uh, art and architecture that took inspiration from it onto a rigorous level. And uh, he too was known for a sort of aesthetic and kind of dandy-like uh, approach to things. And of course that culminated in uh, no less than our boy Oscar Wilde uh, in the 1880s and 90s, who took a double first in classics at Maudlin College um, and of course, is the most uh, is the most um, uh, notorious and famous aesthete uh, of that entire period, um, and like the other two, was was gay. Um, now, speaking of the classics, uh, you know, I, I have to find uh, I have to find some justification for my degree existing. So the uh, the classics is uh, definitely my uh, great interest in uh, the influences of this period. Now, many people uh, are probably aware on some level that uh, what, again, today we would call um, homosexuality was uh, much more widely practiced and accepted on certain terms than it was in Western Europe in the 17 and 18 and, and indeed most of the 1900s. Um, Ancient Greece, and especially the Athens that gave us Plato and, uh, and that whole philosophical, philosophical movement, uh, had a longstanding tradition of kind of um, ritual pederasty, might, might even be the name, the right name for it, where uh, adolescent youths from the ages roughly of 14 to 21 were uh, mentored by older men uh, in, in early middle age, uh, where they would have a social and sexual relationship with these men that would, in the Athenians' terms, sort of uh, bring them into polite society, show them, show them how to act at dinner parties and symposia, um, give them, give them manners and cultivation. And, uh, so this was, uh, this was a common practice in ancient Greece, uh, uh, for centuries up until the rise of Christianity, which, uh, which sort of wiped that out in the middle of the first millennium AD. Um, but, uh, in the BC period, in the, in the sort of uh, archaic and, and classical and Hellenistic periods, uh, we have uh, some of this wonderful poetry um, from poets, much of which is uh, explicitly uh, homo uh, social and homoerotic uh, in nature. Um, the first, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure in this uh, Zoom room full of Oxford scholars that everybody knows their ancient Greek like the back of their hand. But uh, just uh, just in case, uh, I'll uh, I'll read out a translation of part of these poems that I have up here in the Greek. One of them is by Ibukis from the sixth century, writing of his uh, male lover. Um, Yet again, desire, glancing softly at me with his dark eyes, throws me with all his enchantments into the inescapable net of Aphrodite. Oh God, I tremble at his coming, like a prize-winning horse at the edge of old age, driven, driven unwillingly back to the races. And of course, uh, Sappho, uh, the archaic poet from the Isle of Lesbos, gave her name to lesbianism and is in those terms, the OG lesbian. Uh, Sappho is one of my absolute favorite poets and I got to hold some of her papyri at the, um, at the Sappho Library a few months ago, which was a deeply emotional experience for me. But um, her most wonderful poem, number 16, uh, begins thus. Some say a force of cavalry, or of foot soldiers, 
Others say a fleet of ships is the most beautiful thing upon the dark earth, but I say that it is whatever you love. And then the whole rest of this poem goes on to talk about her lover, Anactoria, who was a woman. Um, later scholars had hilarious ways of sort of trying to get around or justify why Sappho was speaking so highly of other women. Um, the usual explanation in the Victorian period was that she was a schoolmistress who really loved her pupils. Uh, there's no evidence for this in ancient sources, and um, it's much better to interpret Sappho's poetry, um, uh, which can be directed both towards women and towards men, as an example, again, of what today we would know as bisexual or queer literature in the ancient world. So, all of these influences, aesthetic and classical and social and sexual, are swirling around in Victorian England at the, the late 19th century. And we've seen some of their proponents who are sort of these chest-beating individualist kind of radical people like Whitman in, in, uh, in America and Carpenter, uh, Carpenter in uh, the UK, uh, their method of expressing themselves and going about things is basically, I'm going to be who I'm going to be and you can't stop me. And both of them would sort of run off to cottages in the wilderness for parts of their lives uh, and, uh, and think nothing of it. The Uranians, now that, we're, now that we're here with the Uranians, the Uranians are nothing like that. What I find so interesting about this movement of poetry is that these authors were not radicals in almost any sense. They were Oxford-educated classicists and priests and school teachers and uh, you know, people with very stable middle-class existences uh, who were even very conservative in, in many ways, uh, especially in their actual artistic outputs form. Their verse forms are extremely traditional and conservative. You'll see lots of iambic pentameter, heroic couplets, that kind of pretty rigid metrical and rhyming scheme. So these Uranians uh, based at Oxford or in sort of yeah, you know, rural towns teaching as a teaching, working as a tutor, they couldn't afford to give up their everything and go into the wilderness like Carpenter or go into exile in Paris like Oscar Wilde did. Uh, instead, they stayed where they were and they wrote in a vocabulary that was familiar to them, um, that was very classical and aesthetically conservative. Um, even then, this writing for them was a kind of escapist fantasy. They knew that the desires they had to be with other men were unacceptable in broader society. And so uh, they wrote to sublimate their love, not to display their talents. Uh, such books as they published were never super widely printed, and most of their work was mainly circulated among friends. So the reason, again, going back to the beginning, why I call them one of the very first identifiable queer literary movements is because this is not disparate individuals like Shakespeare or Byron kind of happening to write about gay themes. This is a group of people who knew each other and were friends and collaborators and wrote letters and corresponded with advice and encouragement and criticism. And uh, so that's, that's why I think it's appropriate to call these Uranians one of the very beginnings of kind of organized queer literature, even though within the grand scheme of things, they were pretty quiet and conservative and do not have much of a place in our sort of modern cultural memory. I think I've, I think I've never yet uh, talked to somebody who, who knew off the top of their heads um, of, these, of these poets. Um, as, a, uh, as sort of an expression of the Uranian mindset uh, and, and ethos, I can actually take the opportunity to read from a copy of a book in, in my own collection, which was a, an anonymously and uh, privately printed translation of certain Greek poems that have kind of a homoerotic bent called um, the Palatine Anthology. But the editor's, um, the editor's uh, introduction, his dedication, is kind of fascinating as a cultural artifact. Um, this little book to thee I dedicate, these ancient songs retold in halting rhyme, 
The Greeks who sang them in the olden time, when Eros reigned, guessed not the present fate of love sublime, mistrust and scornful hate. O come, my sweet, and let us seek a clime where men be pure, and it shall be no crime to call thee friend of friends and my soul's mate. Now, among all of these respectable, stable Oxbridge clerics and, and uh, tutors, almost none of them ever took a long-term partner or had kind of openly known long-term relationships. Uh, nearly all of them passed their careers without scandal and died in more or less obscurity in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, a big result of this uh, failure to kind of live completely according to their values and desires was this, this real frustration that many of them share. So again, many of these poets are writing to sort of sublimate these feelings that they have because they know they can't exercise it. Uh, a, a late member of the Iranian circle named, uh, named uh, Rafe Chubb um, said in one of his poems pretty movingly, give me my heaven, give me my heaven, give me my heaven. All the same, they had the support of friends. Uh, in these two pictures show two of our Exonian Uranians. On the left, the Reverend S. E. Cottom, and on the right, the Reverend E. E. Bradford, author of these books that Exeter now has. Um, they were not lovers, to be clear. Um, they uh, very much identified with this Uranian movement, but did not themselves have or relate any kind of relationship more than friendship. But that's exactly the point, because these men sort of working together, sort of scattered around in a few, in a few locations in, in England, were able to encourage each other in their poetic output uh, and thereby by give definition to the movement that they, that they uh, were sort of creating in themselves. Uh, to the right is an inscription from um, uh, Bradford to another friend, uh, uh, Horatio Brown, just to just to demonstrate, you know, the kind of warmth uh, with which they addressed each other and uh, sent each other their 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 work for for advice and, and criticism. Uh, now, building on these classical uh, models and uh, the kind of social and philosophical and aesthetic background. Uh, the Uranians developed what, what J.A. Simons, whom I mentioned earlier, called the ways of evasion uh, in, order to, uh, in order to kind of get across their message in a socially relatively acceptable or at least non-scandalous way. Um, these guys are not writing things that are filthy or explicit or, you know, they having seen what happens to Oscar Wilde, again, they're, they're fearful of kind of a public backlash. And so they make very certain to couch their poetry in traditional terms where, for example, they speak of friendship and comradeship in that kind of social reformist way, or uh, they, their, their examples of love come from classical or biblical couples. So Simon uh, wrote one poem called The Meeting of Jonathan and David from the Old Testament. You know, but uh, so here's, here's a, a quote from that. Uh, he stayed their steps and in his arms of strength took David and for sore love found at length solace in speech and pressure and the breath wherewith the mouth of yearning winnoweth hearts overcharged for utterance. In that kiss, soul unto soul was knit and bliss to bliss. That fragment does a really good job at illustrating a couple of these aspects of Uranian poetry. Number one, it's rooted in this respectable, acceptable mode of expression using the biblical couple of Jonathan and David, which if a censor or a sort of, you know, censorious yeah, Victorian moralist were to, were to read that, they could pass it off as, oh, well, we're just talking about the deep friendship of two good guys from the Bible. But anybody in the Iranian movements and their, their, their circle reading this would understand uh, that uh, would understand that this reference to Jonathan and David and their uh, arms of strength and their kiss and all of this uh, is a deeply you know, romantic and erotic thing. Um, at the same time, you also may have noticed uh, from that fragment that it's a very rigid form. Uh, the rhymes are, are rigid and even stereotypical. I mean, kiss and bliss is just the most overused rhyme in the English language. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in uh, strict iambic pentameter. So these are not 
innovators with respect to verse form. Um, the other big term that comes up in a Uranian context is shame. Uh, this, you know, unfortunately is, is something that's, that's been with a lot of gay and queer people throughout, throughout history, you know, because of social restrictions on expression and identity that there's this kind of turned inward, you know, shame and frustration, uh, that a lot of them feel, uh, a lot of us feel, and, um, the Iranians, uh, felt this no less, um, uh, one, uh, uh, one of the most famous phrases, uh, in, in fact, maybe the only well-known phrase to come out of this movement was from a poem by Lord Alfred Douglas, Oscar Wilde's lover, in which he called um, gay uh, uh, attraction, the love that dare not speak its name. It has to be silent. It cannot name itself. Um, likewise, another Uranian poet, Montague Summers, wrote, uh, we worship love, adore him, low in the dust before him. We bow down and implore him, give thanks for our sweet shame. Exeter College specifically, among the Oxford Colleges, was a hotbed of Iranian activity. You've already seen pictures of Reverends Bradford and Reverend Cottom, and uh, they knew each other as undergrads at Exeter uh, and developed a collaboration and friendship that would last their whole lives long. Um, Exeter was where they met the first other people they had ever known with similar inclinations to theirs. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, Bradford got his publishing break uh, at Exeter. Um, a few years later, yeah, in the 1890s, uh, Exeter became the home for a, uh, a publication of Uranian material called The Chameleon, which was a magazine run by this, the guy named Bloxham, who was at Exeter. He received the editorship of it from, uh, from Lord Alfred Douglas, who is pictured there, but who was really a terrible person. He sort of betrayed Oscar Wilde, who had given up everything for him, and then uh, Douglas later became a vicious anti-Semite. Uh, so not the greatest history there, but he handed over his Uranian journal to Bloxham at Exeter, um, where it became both an important nexus for collaboration among Oxford Uranians at the time, um, as this list of contents suggests, but actually also part of the evidence presented by the prosecution at Oscar Wilde's trial for indecency. Now, moving to Bradford himself, there's so many, so much of his poetry that reflects these movements and influences that I've tried to outline for you. And that's hopefully, you know, if there are any members of the college sitting in on this, that can be uh, fertile grounds for uh, a research project. Um, one of the most definitive strains of thought in Bradford's poetry is uh, uh, rooted in that social and sexual reform that I outlined earlier. Uh, he has this frustration with heteronormative society and structures, and he wishes he could escape the burdens and expectations that are placed on him in his particular social and educational and, and, uh, and class position. Uh, one of his poems in the collection that, I, that, that's, that Exeter now possess possesses reads, so some men counsel, breed and multiply. The most prolific race at last will win. Send forth your sons in myriads to die or kill their fellows. Till next war begin, breed on with fury. Pour your children in till every shop and factory be full and labor cheap. What if they're starved and thin? I have no heart to procreate, er, uh, birth children for the sword. The love that links me to my mate himself is his reward. He also, uh, unfortunately, buys into a certain strand of misogyny shared by many of these, uh, many of these poets and indeed many men uh, at the time uh, who are very much part of their, still part of their social context. Um, uh, I hope you'll forgive me for the, the last two lines of this, which are a little, <laughs> a little um, uh, strange to read uh, to, to modern ears, but, uh, but this just to show uh, part of the mindset that is affecting Bradford as he writes. Um, Eros is up and away, away. Eros is up and away. The son of Urania, born of the sea, the lover of lads and liberty, strong, self-controlled, erect, and free. He is marching along today. He is calling aloud to the men, the men. He is calling aloud to the men. Turn away from the wench with her powder and paint and follow the boy who is fair as a saint. So 
again, here in, the, in Bradford and in the Iranian poets, we have a whole mess of contradictions. On the one hand, we have genuine innovation in subject where, where few people before had ever in such a concentrated and organized way written of homoeroticism and homoromanticism and just of the desire to escape from the kind of restrictive and oppressive uh, uh, normative structures that were imposed on them in England in this period. On the other hand, we have real adherence to traditional verse forms, uh, participation, again, very much in the kind of uh, social context uh, of, of their time, which is not very kind towards women, um, that takes up this kind of paternalistic, almost imperialistic attitude towards it, its relations with uh, uh, people in lower classes. Um, and so I just hope that this has pointed out, you know, how, how, you know, interesting and vivid and, and contradictory this is as a movement. You know, it's not, generally, it's not particularly great poetry. You know, uh, Oscar Wilde and A.E. Houseman, who were writing about gay themes at the same time, don't really identify with the Iranian movement. Um, so it's not uh, some kind of astounding works of literature, but in classics, there's a very important, you know, idea now in scholarship that, that I agree with fully, which is that, you know, if you want to understand the Roman Empire, you don't just read Cicero and Caesar, you read the graffiti on the walls at Pompeii. And likewise here, if the only idea we had of Victorian queer expression was Oscar Wilde, well, it, it would be a fabulous idea, but uh, a very incomplete idea. And this you know, odd, quiet movements of Uranians, so nearly forgotten these days, uh, can really give us a much broader window into an important part of our literature and our history. And uh, I'll, I'll close just briefly with, with one word on why I'm so glad that the Bradford Collection is at Exeter now. Um, you know, I, as a classicist and a big bibliophile, you know, I, I very much believe that, that uh, books and, and everything written uh, are, in a sense, alive. They, they have a life of their own as the, uh, the records and, you know, as, as the, the only real records of the way that a fellow human being uh, thought and lived. But um, an unread book is a dead thing. And the worst thing that a library can become is, is a tomb for dead books. Uh, and uh, for that reason, it's, uh, it's wonderful to me to see a collection, a, a, a library that really cares about this material and can get used to it, uh, take possession of it, because it's so easy for valuable or rare books to sort of disappear into the shelves of some private collection and uh, be forgotten about for decades until they come up and resurface at auction again. Um, I think the Reverend Bradford would be very happy and proud that after all these years, his work can be uh, used and cherished uh, in a place he loved by people who will understand him on some level. And um, I'll leave the last word to Bradford's friend at Exeter, uh, the Reverend Cottom, uh, which comes from the last book of his poetry and indeed one of the last books of Uranian poetry ever published. Um, Such love is not unique, it still survives although it may be known to but a few, yet some at least receive the precious dole. The past will reappear in other lives because divine to human nature true and lover shall to lover lend his soul. Thank you for your time.